Welcome to Servants of the Lord Ministries. My name is Dr. Keith Jenkins. I'm the International Coordinator for Servants of the Lord Ministries. Before I start my message today, let me share with you the commission of the ministry that was given to Joseph Hedgecock many years ago. He said, I have children in every nation, and you have brothers and sisters whose hearts are crying out to me. They've sought me for ministry, blessings, and gifts. I've given them those things, and it's blessed them. But there is a part of their spirit that it never fulfilled, that is reserved for an intimate relationship with me. Now their hearts are crying out to me just for me. That is who I'm sending you to, because I don't want them to take the years it took you to get to me, because there was no one to show you how at the time. Servants of the Lord Ministries is a teaching and training ministry sent to the body of Christ to reach people with a heart after God. This message is for those who want to get to know Him and grow up in Him. Today I'm sharing a message on the famine of the Word. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word study in Strong's is number 4704, for another word which means to use speed, that is to make effort, be prompt or earnest, to give diligence, to be diligent, endeavor, labor or study. The word study in the King James is translated as eager in the Amplified Bible. Paul here is talking about the qualifications to teach. Timothy had to show by example that he was approved by God. In the Amplified Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Be eager and do your utmost to present yourselves to God approved, tested by trial, a workman, who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. Those who bring messages to equip the saints should, number one, love the truth and be eager for conviction. Number two, be approved and tested by trial with the fruit of repentance too. Number three, work hard, not put a burden on others or be lazy. Number four, analyze the word of truth by the Spirit, not using their minds. Number five, accurately teach and apply the truth that brings about conviction. According to Paul, Timothy was not to permit any discussions in the church that did not lead to repentance and growth. Those who want to know the meaning of words to no end have another agenda. Paul said in Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14, these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. There are some who want to debate the meaning of certain words, but not grow up spiritually. Striving over words is often encouraged under the umbrella of hermeneutics. This is a branch in most theological training that deals with interpretation, especially of the Bible or literary texts. Those subverting anyone who has ears to hear the truth by the Spirit is doing the work of the devil. Causing doubts in the simple teaching of Jesus has serious consequences. Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 and verse 42, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he was cast into the sea. Hermeneutics is a fancy word for interpretation. The word hermeneutics means the interpretation of language, whether written or spoken. Generally, hermeneutics is an activity that interests biblical scholars, and the word is sometimes used in philosophy as well. Philosophy has now crept into the church, and there is no shame. A doctorate of philosophy in theology is considered honorable and a license to preach, but this is mocking God. You cannot come to truth using the natural mind. If the Holy Spirit does not confirm an interpretation is correct, it is not right. P. 
Peter said in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21. I'm reading. This is Second Peter chapter 1. I'm starting in verse 20. Knowing this, first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. The canon of Scripture is made up of 66 documents, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. In his Easter letter of 367, Anthanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, gave a list of exactly the same books that would formally become the New Testament canon, and he used the word canonizing in regard to them. The books of the Bible were confirmed as books that contained infallible truth and no lies since they were inspired by the Holy Spirit in every way. In the book, The Guilted Prison, Revised Edition, in the introduction on page 4, Joseph Edgecott writes, The devil has infiltrated the church with lies disguised as truth, and many believers have released their faith into his deceptions. The prisons identified in this book are the result of Satan's cunning craftiness to deceive believers with wrong beliefs that appear to be right, other prisons are the result of carnality, rebellion, and blatant obedience to God. Those who know the truth in their minds are not free, because the natural mind cannot understand the things of God. They are also getting under condemnation because their lives do not change. You have to appreciate the truth spiritually and become like little children. Jesus said in Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4, I'm reading. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, starting in verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The devil does not want you to grow spiritually. The devil is not afraid of you reading the Bible as long as you use the wrong method of learning so you never come to the truth and change. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. No interpretation of Scripture is private. That means the least in the kingdom without a natural education, can also confirm the correct interpretation using the witness of the Spirit without hearing any arguments for or against one view or another. A simple approach is required. We read in Luke 19, verses 8 and 9. This is Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, starting in verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector at Jericho in the Bible. Salvation came to him through conviction and repentance, after meeting Jesus. A response to conviction is the minimum requirement to be the son of Abraham. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. This is Philippians chapter 3. I'm reading verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. If your life is not changing, you still have a confidence in the flesh. Modern leaders believe lies that you can come to the truth using human intellect and reasoning because they were trained in that way. They do not know how to learn spiritually and they have infected those in the body of Christ with the same system of learning. Paul said in 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. I'm reading 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm starting in verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Verse 17, and their word will eat as do, does a canker of whom is in Hymenaeus and Philetus. Timothy was warned not to allow any vain talk that led to an increase in ungodliness and that this could also spread to others. In the Amplified Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 says, But avoid all empty, vainless, useless, idle talk, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their teaching will devour, it will eat its way like cancer, or spread like gangrene. So it is with Hymenaeus and Philetus. The devil has taught leaders to study with their own minds, causing division. The number of different denominations in the body of Christ today is confusing. Any fruit of leaders using their minds. We read in Proverbs 14 and verse 12. This is Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Only those in the body of Christ on the narrow way, eager for God's approval, are anointed to share the word of truth, because they are changing. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. The fruit of a changed life is the best commercial for truth. If you love truth, you also don't mind how you hear truth. It can come to you through anyone on a humble platter. Paul explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm starting in verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Verse 28. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. The word confound in Strong's is number 2617. It defines as Shame down, that is disgrace, put to the blush, confound or dishonor. God rarely uses those who have a natural education in the church. Those seeking a sense of self-worth by human standards or social standing are serving the devil. Churches run by Pharisees today are surprised to see the less educated having such godly wisdom. We read in the book of Acts, chapter 4, and verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. If you are still trying to advance and obtain the things of the world, you will be convicted and put to shame through good preaching. Your value in Christ should be based on how much he uses you personally. Through repentance he will use you more. Paul said in Second Timothy chapter two verses twenty and twenty one. This is Second Timothy chapter two, I'm starting in verse twenty. But in the great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. Verse twenty one. If a man therefore purges himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Those who repent and get free from sin have demonstrated spiritual wisdom. If you follow Christ, then you are denying yourself and taking up a cross daily. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24. This is Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. 
Do not justify your spiritual apathy by comparing yourself with anyone else based on secular wisdom. Your natural achievements are not even on God's scale of intelligence. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm reading verse 19. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. Verse 20. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Those following Christ get wisdom on the narrow way from seeking how to please him. He also takes care of everything else. Those who are foolish are relying on their own natural wisdom and still feeding the flesh. Jesus said in Matthew 25, Verses 1 to 5, I'm reading. This is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, I'm reading verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Verse 2. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Verse 3. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Verse 4. But though wise took all in their vessels with their lamps. Verse 5. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. The oil here in this parable of the wise and foolish virgins represents godly wisdom obtained by following Christ on the narrow way. His wisdom comes at a price. You cannot just have what you want in this life and solve things with money. Even a foolish virgin can learn something from the Holy Spirit, but only the wise virgins use that wisdom afterwards and take it with them. The rest get left behind. As we get closer to the coming of Jesus, those who do not have the right foundation will listen to conspiracy theories and comments on social media instead. When it looks like Jesus is not coming, all of them will fall asleep. This is what it will be like just before the last Gentile is saved. James says in James chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. This is James chapter 3, I'm reading verse 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Be prepared to reject what may appear to be good based on the witness of the Spirit. Man's wisdom will appeal to the flesh, just like it did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. It might be 90% good, but it's still corrupt. The motive and attitude of the flesh is devilish. Only God's wisdom is pure. You can only obtain this wisdom by following Christ, trusting in the precious promises like a little child. False preachers will say, God gave you a brain, he expects you to use it. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, I'm reading. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. I'm starting in verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in that way. Verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. In the book, The Guilted Prison, Revised Edition, in the introduction on pages 4 and 5, Joseph Hedgecott writes, When Satan prevents you from walking through the straight gate and on the narrow way, you are already on your way to spiritual destruction. If he can separate you from fellowship with the Lord because you follow the broad way, he is succeeding in stealing spiritual life from you. If you can be imprisoned by lust of the flesh or addictions, Satan will use those methods. If you will not yield to that type of imprisonment and are determined to walk with God, Satan will seduce you with ways that seem right. The kingdom of God is available by the Spirit, 
since the day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago. So you can trust and obey instead of using your mind. You may know who Jesus is in your head, and you know what Jesus taught, but are still afraid of the narrow way. You do not believe in your heart that God is who he says he is. Paul said in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, this is Hebrews 11 and verse 6, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you do not believe in God giving rewards for diligently seeking him, you will not be seeking. Examine yourself and see what you do because that is what you believe in your heart. Faith without works is dead. You think you are safe because you are born again with your standard prayers, your methods and traditions and a quiet time now and again. You might be like Thomas in the upper room. We read in John 14 verses 5 and 6. This is John's Gospel chapter 14 starting in verse 5. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Verse 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Those who are still carnal want to fulfill the lusts of their flesh, make decisions with their own understanding. Using the mind generates doubts because you cannot come to truth that way. Those who have faith in a relationship with God can ask Jesus any question and get an immediate response by the Holy Spirit. Any teaching that undermines the need to ask Jesus Christ what to do is wrong because Jesus is Lord now. His kingdom is here now. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. This is Matthew's Gospel chapter 7. I'm reading verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of the Father, which is in heaven. The church ignorantly has been learning principles in the Bible to their shame. On the narrow way, you get information on a need-to-know basis. You will have to endure correction, but you get truth. Paul said in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16, this is Galatians chapter 4, and verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Are you eager to hear another strong message? Do you love conviction? If you are eager to present yourself to God and be corrected, then you'll be spiritually useful in the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 11, I'm reading verse 12 all the way to verse 19. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, starting in verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John. Verse 14. And if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was to come. Verse 15. And he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 16. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It's like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. Verse 17. And saying, We have piped unto you, and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. Verse 18. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he hath a devil. Verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of our children. Christian activity or sacrifice cannot replace repentance. According to prophecy, Elijah is coming back again during the tribulation and will call the Jews to repentance. This will happen just before the second coming, but after the first resurrection. To wait for this time to repent is not wise. It's a bit late for those who want to enter the kingdom and be part of the bride of Christ. When Elijah comes, there will not be much time for repentance and to produce the fruit of repentance either. 
Jesus said to the religious Jews in Matthew 21 and verse 32, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards, that you might believe him. Now is the time to produce the fruit of repentance, since the Spirit has been poured out. God in his love sent John the Baptist, who had the same spirit of Elijah, to give the Jews a chance to repent and get ready for the kingdom coming on the day of Pentecost. The Jews ignored the warning of John and the miracles of Jesus as well. The Jewish leaders did not have ears to hear, even through the Acts of the Apostles. Stephen said in Acts chapter 7, verse 51 to 53, this is in the book of Acts, chapter 7, starting in verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. Verse 52, which of the prophets hath not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Verse 53, who hath received the law by disposition of angels, and have not kept it. The last generation has become comfortable with technology. There's a lot of activity and church ministry, but excuses are made for holiness. Instead of respecting the Holy Spirit, His people do whatever they want. There is no compunction about making negative comments and people pass on gossip through social media. If someone is convicted and corrected through good teaching, this is too radical. A person God uses mightily can even be accused of serving the devil. So nothing has changed much in 2,000 years. Those who are wise will hear what is being said in whatever form the truth is presented. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, I'm reading. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. He said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears verse 4 and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables god's standards are very high and can be reached by faith in his power on the narrow way following him it is easy because you start by dealing with the things that cause your flesh to manifest then through repentance you obtain a solid foundation. Paul said in Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. And let every one that names the name of Jesus Christ depart from iniquity. With the flesh in the grave, you can do anything God wants. Obeying the truth does involve some suffering for the sake of the truth. And those who complain about a little discomfort for following Christ will often endure hardship to follow some dream or desire that has no eternal value. The sufferings for unrighteous acts is far worse and leads to spiritual death and hell. But the devil does not tell you this. On the narrow way, for example, you cannot do what you want take a bribe or answer back. Jesus also requires that you love your enemies. Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 to 4. I'm reading Galatians chapter 3. I'm starting verse 1. He said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth 
crucified among you. Verse 2. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Verse 4. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? The Galatians got off the narrow way and stopped obeying the truth. Paul called that foolish. They started seeking a righteousness by keeping the law. Those who depart from the truth have an agenda. They want righteousness following a written code so they can still do what they want. It's self-deception to think that you will be ready for his appearing without being in the Spirit all the time. Jesus had to fulfill the law so that we do not have to keep the law any more. He had to qualify to die for the sins of the whole world. It does not mean that the law cannot bring conviction. However, there are only two rules in the kingdom of God. Number one, whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do, do it. Number two, whatever the Holy Spirit tells you not to do, do not do it. Paul had to say to the Corinthians that they were not wise. They had made principles and rules for everything. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, we read, This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and starting in verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Verse 2. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hereto you were not able to bear it, neither yet are you now able to bear it. Verse 3. For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Strife and divisions arise when you try to make one rule for every class and every culture. When you compare yourself with others, you are judging others and commending yourself. Only compare yourself with Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 to 14, I'm reading. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they are measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Verse 13. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach out even unto you. Verse 14. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reached not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. The only standard that applies to everyone is, did you do what God said? Everyone has the same opportunity to obey the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you have given a cup of water to a prophet, you will not lose your reward. God's system is very different to the world. Jesus said in Matthew 23, verses 11 and 12. This is Matthew chapter 23 and verse 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Verse 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. On the narrow way, you will have some difficulties. However, the grace of God is sufficient, so you do not have to compromise on truth. Spiritual learning is pure because it does not involve the natural mind. No lesson is the same. On the broad road, you can be born again and still be heading for destruction. If you are still using your mind trying to understand the things of God, you have chosen ignorance. James said in James chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, I'm reading. This is James chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Of his own, he begat us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Verse 20. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Anger is a fruit of your ignorance. 
is also a sign that you are definitely not listening to God and talking when you should be listening. You will get frustrated trying to do things in the flesh. Jesus focused on doing the will of the Father and never got angry. He was tempted like us in his humanity. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16. This is Hebrews chapter 4. I'm reading verse 15. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like us, as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We need grace and mercy to hear God all the time and keep learning, and especially when we come out of his presence. We read it in the Psalms 84 and verses 1 and 2. This is in the Psalms, chapter 84, I'm reading verse 1. To the chief musician, unto Gittia, a psalm for the sons of Korah. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Verse 2. My soul Yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. The psalmist wanted to be in the courts of the Lord, to experience God's judgment and correction. This is the safest place to be. David was speaking to his intercessor. We read in Second Samuel 24 and verse 14. This is Second Samuel chapter 24. I'm reading verse 14. And David said unto Gad, I am at a great strait. Let us fall now into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hands of men. David knew that God is fair in his dealing with man. We all have a responsibility to get in Christ and grow up, or we will get left behind. Without conviction and correction, there is no growth. Some prefer to deceive themselves with their dead religion so they can still be Lord of their own lives. Christianity is not just another religion. It's a relationship with a living God. Those who are walking in the light have the fruit of repentance and change. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 15 to 19. This is Matthew chapter 7. I'm starting in verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Verse 17. Even so every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Verse 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Verse 19. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. If you need to make a fresh start, begin with the milk of the word. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm starting in verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, verse 3, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Read the written word, but let the Holy Spirit decide what is important. Leaders whose lives are not changing may encourage you to study the written word, but they cannot help you. Those with just a formal education cannot apply the word spiritually because they are carnally minded. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 to 8. This is Romans chapter 8, I'm starting in verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Make sure that you are like a little child and teachable. The Holy Spirit will convict you in an area where you need to study. Keep a notebook of bad fruit. 
I suggest a daily record should include the following. Number one, missing God's timing. Number two, ignoring any direct instructions from God. Number three, not doing simple tasks God is always reminding you to do. Number four, forgetting things. Number five, making excuses based on what others do or don't do. Number six, making more mistakes under pressure. I believe every child of God has access to the Spirit of Truth personally, and He can bring back anything important to your mind through the Holy Spirit. You need to expect this if you're following Jesus. Jesus said to His disciples in John 14 and verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Truth is still very rare today, as most live in darkness hiding from conviction. If you're not processing conviction, how can you help anyone else? In the last days there will not be a lack of the preaching of God's word, but there is a famine of hearing. We read in Amos chapter 8, verses 9 to 12. I'm reading the book of Amos, chapter 8, starting in verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. Verse 10. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation, and I'll bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and boldness upon every head, and I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Verse 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. It should be the aim of every minister of the gospel to rightly divide the word of truth. Even a good message now and again is not enough. Those who only rely on a certain preacher for truth are just snacking. By responding to conviction, you will get a full meal from the Holy Spirit. In the last days, God is increasing His grace, but this is given to the humble. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, I'm reading verses 5 to 9. This is 1 Peter chapter 5, I'm starting in verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you, be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The light afflictions Peter is talking about will not deter anyone on the narrow way that is seeking God with all their heart. The devil has been offering an alternative to truth and conviction by appealing to man's lust for knowledge so that he could corrupt the doctrines of Christ with the same system of learning that the world uses. Those who are comfortable say it doesn't matter. However, it does mean you have to be hungry for truth. Jesus declared truth is everyone's personal responsibility. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. I'm reading verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Verse 8. For every one that asks receives, and he that seeks will find, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. 
Only those who seek will find. Those who are not seeking with all their heart will end up believing lies. The Father has sent anointed preachers from time to time, but this is for his own purposes, to ensure that everyone gets a chance at full salvation. Truth has the potential to set us free, but some think they are safe just because they are born again. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 30 to 34. This is John's Gospel, chapter 8, I'm reading verse 30. And he spoke these words, and many believed on him. Verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Verse 33. And they answered and said, We are Abraham's seed. We're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Verse 34. And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. If you are still sinning, you are not coming to truth. The devil's kingdom is built on lies. The devil does not want the word of truth preached because the word of truth will set his prisoners free, both in the church and in the world. Preachers and evangelists know the importance of the Bible, but they don't necessarily know the importance of the word of truth and conviction. Truth comes at a price, and it's not obtained by intellectual study. Truth has to set you free from sin before you can help anyone else. You have to be willing to repent of the lies you believe first. Peter said in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. I'm reading Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. Those who have been set free are using the precious promises skillfully themselves and are coming to repentance. They're getting free from sin daily by following Christ. I was ordained to teach and preach in Servants of the Lord Ministries. However, I was not authorized to teach things that had not changed me first. This appeared to be very hard saying. I had a lot of repenting to do before my first seminar. However, the best study is to see if your lives are lining up to the truth or not. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 to 7. I'm reading 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Verse 6. But I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. Verse 7. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Paul was going through difficult times, and it looked like Paul was unapproved by God, especially after he ended up in prison for the sake of the gospel. Those things Paul went through were to prove that the gospel worked in all circumstances. Those trying to serve God and money did not want to hear this. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 to 21. I'm reading Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. Verse 16. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Verse 17. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Verse 18. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in prejudice or in truth, Christ is preached, I therein do rejoice. Yea, I will rejoice. Verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, and now also, 
Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Verse 21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul was happy that the gospel was being preached. He knew that someone with the gift of the Holy Spirit could seek truth, repent, and get ready for his appearing. Paul was not concerned about his well-being, unlike those promoting material gain and earthly blessings. Paul knew that he was doing God's perfect will. His life on earth was an opportunity for Christ to be manifest through suffering, and if not, then his death would result in total gain. We read in Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is Ezekiel chapter 12, I'm reading verse 1. The word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, Verse 2, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see, and see not. They have ears to hear, and hear not, for their rebellious house. Joseph Hedgecock explained in chapter 12 of his book, Wake Up, Time is Running Out, Volume 2, Growing Up Spiritually, on page 209. This is the truth. If you are not walking close to where you should be, you are and have been in rebellion. It's a silent rebellion because you actively participate in the ministry, but you will not do what God says. Instead, you choose to listen to Satan and yield yourself to obey him and his lies rather than to obey God and his truth. People in the church just see the narrow way as another option. In the same way, the Jews did not have ears to hear. Jesus' first coming was their last chance to be ready before the kingdom of God came on the day of Pentecost. Jesus was speaking to the Jewish leaders, and we read in Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 to 41. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12. I'm reading verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Verse 41. And the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it because they repented of the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus was only thirty to thirty-three years of age, and was not attractive to those who beheld him. He was a carpenter by trade. Will you let some simple things stop you from hearing the truth through God's messenger? We read in Matthew 13 and verse 57. This is Matthew 13 and verse 57. And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto him, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. We are in the last days, and a message of repentance is needed, but the church just wants to sing their favorite songs and keep the format of the church unchanged, despite a major pandemic. Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 16, I'm reading verses 7 to 13. This is John's Gospel, chapter 16, I'm starting in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For I, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Verse 8. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Verse 9, of sin because they believe not on me. Verse 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Verse 11, of judgment because the Prince of the world is judged. Verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Verse 13, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The word of truth is not skillfully taught today because there is no demand for truth. 
non-convicting messages are popular and well-funded. Teachings that are comfortable for the flesh do not bring about growth. The word that brings the maximum amount of growth is the word of truth. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. I'm reading 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 16. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Verse 17. For this cause I have sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul had many testimonies of faith that he wanted Timothy to pass on. Timothy was not told to teach on different theological subjects as in a modern Bible seminary. God's school is walking with God on the narrow way. Those on the narrow way are under pressure, but overcome by trusting in the precious promises, just like Jesus. He is our example who submitted himself to the Father's plan. For the joy of setting us free, he endured the cross. He became the sacrifice for sin, so everyone could get in his presence and get all the help needed through the Holy Spirit to live like him. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 to 4, I'm reading. This is Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Verse 4. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The narrow way makes no sense to the natural mind, and you are helpless, but it ensures that everything is done right. Without God's input, there is no life. There is no selfishness in God, so you do not need to fear the narrow way. Sin is anything contrary to God's perfect will in thought, purpose, and action. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 16, I'm reading. This is Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Verse 15 that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Verse 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. If you are still grumbling, complaining, arguing, disputing, you do not have the word of life. Those who welcome trials and difficulties shine because they are called to be salt and light for the rest of the world by seeking to do God's perfect will through the gift of eternal life. Those on the narrow way pass on the truth they learn to others so they could also walk with God more consistently. Even with God's grace, no one can learn everything in one generation. We are God's relay team, not competing in the Olympics, but trying to win the crown of life. You can say you believe in Jesus, but your faith is dead if you're not following him on the narrow way. Faith that is only in your mind is dead. What you believe in your heart is what you do. If you're not on the narrow way, you are not in God's Olympics. The devil is using the same tricks again and again because the church is ignorant of God's ways that are so much higher than man's ways. Here are some simple instructions in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. This is Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, I'm reading verse 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
Verse 24. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Verse 25. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and loses himself or becomes a castaway? There is corruption even in trying to save your own life. Your motive has to be love for God and doing His perfect will. Otherwise, your faith is not pure. Those on the narrow way have to cling to God, rely on and trust in Him daily. He is faithful. Following Christ, you have to rely on the precious promises to overcome. God makes sure you are not tempted beyond what you are able to endure. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but which is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Paul ended up in prison after stirring up trouble and casting out demons in Philippi and Macedonia. He was thrown in prison without a proper trial, but he did not say anything. We read in Acts chapter 16, verse 23 to 31. This is in the book of Acts, chapter 16. I'm reading verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Verse 24. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, and made their feet fast in the stocks. Verse 25. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Verse 27. And the keeper of the prison Awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Verse 29. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Verse 30. And brought them out and said, Stirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. In the Amplified Bible, Acts 16, verse 31 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give yourself up to him. Take yourself out of your own keeping, and entrust yourself into his own keeping, and you will be saved. If you want to be saved, you have to take yourself out of your own hands and put yourself in his hands. People don't want to hear this today. He said they prefer a religion where they can still do whatever they want. Jesus is Lord now and he is ruling now. It's not enough to just believe Jesus died on the cross. It's a proven fact that he died and rose again. The devil could not kill Jesus. Death could not hold him. Even the devil could not stop the kingdom coming in great power on the day of Pentecost. According to Paul, you must do three things to be saved. Number one, reject your own lordship, giving yourself up to him. Number two, stop looking after yourself and your own interests. Number three, put yourself in his keeping and trust him with all your heart. Those looking after their own interests will be drawn back into the world and start using their minds again instead of asking the Lord. We read in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 to 7. This is Proverbs chapter 3. I'm starting in verse 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not your own understanding. Verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Verse 7. Be not wise in their own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. In the book, Wake Up, Time is Running Out, Volume 1, Foundations of Spiritual Maturity. In chapter 1, on pages 15 and 16, Joseph Hedgecott writes, Even if you're a seasoned saint, mature minister, go back and make sure the first works are established in you. Remember that your trust in Jesus 
is directly proportional to the level you have fallen in love with him and know him. When you love him unconditionally, you will acknowledge him in all your ways and obey him because you trust him with all your heart. On the narrow way, you will experience some pressure, but God's grace is sufficient. The pressure on the narrow way is there to expose those hidden desires that need repentance. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. By following Christ and repenting of what he reveals, you can abide in his presence and get to know him. God is holding back the consequences of sin so that you can come to repentance and process sin properly. You only need grace and truth to overcome sin on the narrow way. We read in John chapter 1 and verse 17. This is John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law was not given to everyone. God chose the smallest nation and took them into the wilderness to be dependent on him. He nearly killed them all because of their rebellion. The psalmist said in Psalms 95, I'm reading verses 7 to 11. This is the Psalms, chapter 95, starting in verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you... Hear his voice. Verse 8. Harden not your heart, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Verse 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Verse 10. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Verse 11 unto whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. The Jews saw the miracles in the wilderness, but did not believe. The Jews were to demonstrate to the whole world how salvation works by trusting God. The law came to alert them to sin first so they could come to repentance with God's help. Those who were humble were convicted and came back to God. They got the help they needed to stop sinning through an intimate relationship with God apart from the law and woke up to righteousness by faith. The Jews were supposed to have a testimony of putting him first, overcoming sin and the devil with God providing for them in the wilderness. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 11, in verses 8 to 10, I'm reading. This is Hebrews chapter 11, starting verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive as an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Verse 9. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was not trusting in the works of the Lord, but looking for that building whose maker is God. He was looking for the new creation, and he found the new creation by relying on the promises of God, following Christ on the narrow way. Abraham was an example to the Jews, but they built something else, declaring themselves righteous because they would not deal with their own flesh. The church seems to be hiding from conviction today as well. John said in 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, I'm reading 1 John chapter 3, I'm starting in verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he's righteous. Verse 8. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. 
For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Those who do the right thing all the time are righteous. Sin is just the fruit that someone is not hearing the Lord. Paul said in Romans 8 and verse 4, this is Romans chapter 8 and verse 4, that the rights of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. God's plan from the beginning was to do everything by His Spirit. God's people need to wake up to righteousness through faith. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. In the Amplified Bible in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34 says, Awake from your drunken stupor and return to sober sense and your right minds and sin no more. For some of you have not the knowledge of God. You are utterly and willfully and disgracefully ignorant and continue to be so, lacking the sense of God's presence and all true knowledge of Him. I say this to your shame. You do not have to be ignorant anymore on how to stop sinning. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Only those hearing God at the same speed at which they need to make decisions can easily stop sinning and feeding the flesh. If you cannot hear God fast enough, you will be under pressure to use your mind instead. Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 6, I'm reading all the way to verse 10. This is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, starting in verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go ye out to meet him. Verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Verse 8. And the foolish ones said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Verse 9. But the wise ones answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Jesus is coming soon, and right now everyone is awake and wants to hear the word because of the signs of the time. But there is still a famine of the hearing of the word of truth. As the world is returning to normal, all those virgins fall asleep again. This is not a time to sleep, but awake to righteousness and learn. Through the cross, you have inherited the glorious gospel and a chance to confess all your sins and learn from all your mistakes. It should not be necessary for God to send you a prophetic word to wake you up. You will fall asleep again if you do not get on the narrow way. Mankind was designed to hear God and obey Him and live like little children. We read in Luke 8 and verse 19 to 21. This is in Luke's Gospel, chapter 8 and verse 19. Then came to Him His mother and His brethren, and could not come at Him for the press. Verse 20. And it was told Him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. Verse 21. And Jesus answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are those which hear the word of God and do it. Those who have the Holy Spirit can hear and obey instantly. This is what makes us Christians, not just keeping Christian doctrines and traditions. A Christian is someone who, number one, is Christ-like. Number two, hears his voice clearly. Number three, knows Christ personally. Number four, follows Christ. And number five, has the fruits of Christ. Christianity is not just another religion. It's a relationship with the living God. It's now possible to do the will of God by the Spirit. Jesus said in John 10, 
verse 27 and 28. I'm reading John's Gospel, chapter 10, starting in verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Jesus brought grace and truth, so mankind can live in God's kingdom forever, not just for this time. Jesus came and died for the sins of the whole world at the right time, just before the kingdom came. Nearly 2,000 years have passed, and every generation and every culture has had a chance to learn and enter the kingdom now if they have ears to hear. We read in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 41. This is Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Verse 40. With many other words did he testify and, and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. Those who received the word with joy were baptized by Peter on the day of Pentecost. He did not baptize three thousand people. It was only those who could rejoice about the conviction that was coming through Peter's message and recognize that they were serving the devil. James said in James chapter 1 and verse 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. You can stop sinning through the engrafted word of truth, which has to replace the lies of the devil you believed. This requires a repentance from dead words. In the Amplified Bible, James 1 and verse 21 says, So get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness, and in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which, implanted and rooted in your hearts, contains the power to save your souls. Follow the steps here in James. Through conviction, acknowledge what is unclean, and stop anything that is wicked or harmful to anyone else, the devil offers a freedom to do whatever you want. This type of freedom is very popular in the church today. Paul said in Second Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. This is Second Corinthians chapter 3, I'm starting verse 17. Now where the Lord is, that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 18, But we with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Keep to the boundaries God set for you by the Holy Spirit, and abide in Christ. You will experience life from the corruption as Jesus promised. Jesus said in John Chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. This is John's Gospel, chapter 10. I'm starting verse 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10. The thief cometh not, but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Those following Christ are not claiming to be without sin, but by grace they abide. They know they have to change and repent with God's help once the alarm is sounded through conviction. John said in 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. This is 1 John chapter 1, I'm starting verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us 
our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The word brings conviction in everyone from time to time. However, if you really repent of something, you don't do it again. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to 10, I'm reading. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry though it was but for a season. Verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. Paul was not glad that his first letter to the Corinthians made them sad. However, Paul rejoiced because through his letter the Corinthians repented in a godly manner. You may feel better immediately when you confess your sins. However, repentance has not started. Your life will go back to the way it was without getting to the root of sin through godly sorrow. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 11. This is Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, after it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. For you to get to the root of sin, you will, number one, acknowledge that truth has come and rejoice. Number two, Thank God for exposing those lies you were believing. Number three, confess your sin to God and get forgiveness. Number four, experience joy in his presence with no condemnation. Number five, embrace the truth and grieve over your spiritual unfaithfulness. Number six, meditate on his faithfulness and let him show you why you listen to lies. Number seven, Seek to replace those lies with the truth that God shows you. Number eight, seek God for another opportunity to obey God perfectly with the new understanding he gave you by the Spirit in your heart. You will be changed by the word when you remove the programs that the devil has put in your life and they are replaced with his engrafted word. Overcoming sin is part of repentance in a godly manner. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 15 to 17, I'm reading. This is Hebrews chapter 10, starting verse 15. The Holy Ghost is also a witness to us, for after that he had said before, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them, verse 17, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. When the pressure keeps coming from God on the narrow way, that is an in indication God still remembers your sins. If you want him to forget your sins and iniquities, then you have to pass your test. You let him write his law in your heart, not just your mind. Once I had confessed my sin and welcomed his ingrafted word, I asked God to bring about situations where I could exercise my newfound faith with a little bit of extra pressure too. If I still sinned in the same situation, then I would ask God again until I found all the axes of the enemy. With his word firmly in place, I experienced the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I knew I had repented when I stopped sinning in an area where I was convicted. I hope you have ears to hear. Paul mentioned there was a famine of hearing in the church too. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11, I'm reading. This is Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11. 
of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. People who sin are deceiving themselves, that they can sin and still stop. Under pressure they use their minds and say it does not matter. Carnal Christians know they cannot get permission for what they're doing when they are sinning, and they rely on the fact that they will get forgiveness later. They are not willing to endure correction and chastening and remain a baby as a result. They are using the grace of God to go on sinning and making excuses for sin. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. Today there are many denominations that are not rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth because they are using their minds. Bible school encourages men to use their minds to study the Bible using the same method of learning that is in this world. If you're still pretending to be spiritual but using your mind you are deceiving yourself and misleading others also. There are consequences of passing on lies and being a bad example. You cannot envy those who have something in this world or those God is using more than you. There is a cost for following Jesus and you need to repent and work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. What others are doing or not doing is not your concern. Leaders are trying to motivate God's people to read the Bible but his people would if Jesus was their first love. If you have tasted the Lord is good, then you should have made him Lord and your life will be changing already. This is the best commercial for his word. It's easy to make a fresh start. I suggest you take everything you know and consider to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. Reject wisdom of this world. Start again in the Spirit with just conviction of the Holy Spirit to lead you. Repent of whatever He shows you through the milk of the Word and trust the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth. Every time you repent and something passes away, this will unblock your hearing. If you are in the kingdom, doing what He is directing, He takes care of the rest. There is no separation from God if you keep repenting. He wants you to learn from your mistakes. You can find the root of repentance with God's help without any distractions from the devil. This is more than just knowledge of doctrines or theology. This is a living relationship. You may have a hundred sins, but there is usually only one root, and that is that you do not trust God with all your life because you're still making the decisions yourself. We read in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. I'm reading the book of Isaiah, chapter 1. I'm starting in verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Verse 19. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. The Father personally will help you overcome sin. Jesus said in John, chapter 17, Verses 2 and 3, I'm reading. This is John's Gospel, chapter 17 and verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You are serving the King of Kings. You need to use the gift of eternal life to do something that will please him. Eternal life is not just living forever. Even the devil will live forever in the lake of fire with all his followers. Eternal life is the privilege to know God now and communicate with Jesus and the Father directly. You will need the gift of eternal life now and for all eternity. Only those who use the gift of eternal life on the narrow way will be ready when he appears. It's not enough to be born again. Otherwise, Jesus would have to apologize to Paul for all that suffering and hardship he went through. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, 
whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. You will have a fight to stay on the narrow way. Through the gift of eternal life, you will get all the answers you need. Many have been taught to give God some minutes or seconds in the morning, but do not believe He is speaking all the time. However, we were given the gift of eternal life so we could hear, get to know, and follow him in this period when there is a famine of the hearing of his word. You have an advantage over everyone else through the gift of eternal life. There is no freedom from sin if you go back to using your mind. God is not the problem. Everything you need is in Christ. Some people think that God should do more for us even though we have such a great salvation. God loved us and sent his son to be a servant, but now he is Lord and in a place to help you in his kingdom. Use grace and truth to abide. In the book, The Kingdom of God Now, in chapter 7, on page 81, Joseph Hedgecock writes, We as Christians call Jesus Lord and say we want to live in his kingdom. Yet when he says, to bow our knee to him and submit, we resist him. We profess that we want to spend eternity with the Lord. We praise him and tell lost people that Jesus is Lord, yet when it's time for us to submit, we resist him. We look for excuses and try to justify our rebellion, but there is no getting around it. If you aren't bowing your knee on a daily basis to his lordship, and acknowledging him in all your ways, you are in rebellion. It's as simple as that. You can cover it up, lie to yourself, but on the day of judgment, the hidden things of darkness will be brought to light. Through humility, you can get to be part of the greatest kingdom. Getting angry at your fellows will not help either because the flesh cannot change the flesh. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Paul spoke about the living word in his second letter to the Corinthians. He had to write a strong letter, but this produced repentance and change. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 to 3, I'm reading 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and starting in verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Verse 2. You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Verse 3. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, Ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. The best reference for any preacher is the transformation that takes place and the fruit of repentance in others. Paul had to say to them in his first letter that they were still carnal. He said to them at a time when they should have been teachers, they were still babes. They should have been far ahead and they were having many seminars but not feeding off the living word something changed there was a transformation through repentance people today want knowledge without conviction this is a recipe for destruction many seem to focus on the mysteries and feed themselves on endless theories and never come to truth but what about plain scripture Joseph Hedgecock, the author of the book, My Sheep Hear My Voice, decided to work on the plain scripture first before he started studying the mysteries that people disagree on. He thought at first glance this would not take long, but afterwards he was still working on applying and putting into practice those simple truths. It would take you some time to apply truth, and you'll always be doing this even when you're a mature saint. We read in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 5 to 12. I'm reading the book of Acts, chapter 16, starting in verse 5. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. 
Verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Verse 8. And they passing by Mysidia came down to Troas. Verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Verse 10. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. Verse 11. Therefore, losing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis. Verse 12. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city that part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. Paul did not have a problem hearing the Lord when he was following Christ. In Macedonia at that time, they ended up reaching the whole city in a short time. Paul had to demonstrate the same wisdom as Christ in that situation. Even though he was wrongly accused, he did not react and said nothing. God kept working on his behalf and he had an amazing experience that caused the jailer to come to a living relationship with Jesus. Only God knows what is next. All you need to know is him. So do not fear what might happen. This fear will stop you from experiencing his grace, a miracle and divine answer. If you want to hear, get to know and follow Jesus, then I can recommend this book, My Sheep, Hear My Voice by Joseph Hedgecock. If you want to make a fresh start and get on the narrow way, sow in the Spirit daily, experience full salvation and freedom through regular repentance, then I can recommend the book, Wake Up, Time is Running Out, Volume 1, Foundations of Spiritual Maturity by Joseph Hedgecock. Do not accept a counterfeit version of Christianity based on religious works so you don't have to deny yourself daily and trust God. If you know that you have resisted the truth and want to know why, then I can recommend the book The Guilted Prison, revised edition by Joseph Hedgecock. The message today is about the famine of the hearing of God's word. I believe God is transmitting his perfect will for every child of his. He loves us and he wants us to hear that word. But there are things in you that are hindering you from hearing what God wants to say. And by getting on that narrow way and submitting yourself to God, you will find out what those things are. People have a confidence in the flesh. They say, preacher, preacher, tell me what God is saying. But even if the preacher told them, if he could, they still would not hear because they have a confidence in the flesh. They'd be unable to change. And then they would assume that that is no longer the problem. God loves us. And the only way we can be free from the corruption that's in this world is to get on that narrow way. And I encourage you right now to totally deny yourself daily and take up your cross daily and make that your commitment from now on. Don't back off. Those are simple instructions. And I'm going to pray with you right now. Heavenly Father, to those who've been listening to this message, God, you've been speaking to them because they've become hard of hearing. They're even crying out, saying, Lord, what are you saying? But they have allowed themselves to become hardened by listening to another voice, a voice that speaks to them comfort and gives them an easier option. Father, I pray that they may recognize that they are falling asleep and wake up before time runs out. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you. 
You will find a summary of the scriptures used in today's message below the video, either written out or in a, via a link to our website. Our contact details will follow at the end of this message. Please get in touch. God bless you.